It was very much in my mind to have my first picture be a genre picture. I loved film noir. I loved particularly Out of the Past and Asphalt Jungle and those movies. So it was a sexy movie and it gave me an opportunity to do a couple things that I wanted to do for the first movie. It, the language of film noir was very extravagant. Most men are little boys. Maybe you should drink at home. Stylized. Too quiet. Maybe you shouldn't dress like that. This is a blouse and skirt. I don't know what you're talking about. I felt that I could have a lot of fun with this kind of extravagant language. You shouldn't wear that body. The other thing that I had loved about the film noir was the Baroque freedom of the camera. And I thought, this genre is going to give me an opportunity in my first film to try a lot of things because I don't know if I'll ever get to make a second film. And I wanted to make sure that the first one had a lot of fun associated with it. It had taken me a long time to start selling screenplays. Then I sold two very quickly, and that led me to George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, and I wound up writing Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Empire Strikes Back. And um, what happened was Alan Ladd Jr., who was involved with the Star Wars series, was running 20th Century Fox at that time. It was offering me things to write. And I said, I'm not writing for anybody anymore. Now I'm going to direct. He said, well, what do you want to direct? And I said, I'm going to write something for myself, and here it is. And I told him the Body Heat story. When I was in the middle of writing it, he left the studio. Luckily, Laddie, as Alan Ladd Jr. was called, had started his own company, the Ladd Company. And he said, come over to Warner Brothers, where the Ladd Company was, and I'll make it there. But you need to have a sponsor. So I went to George Lucas. He loved the script. He said, I will sponsor you. I will stand up for you. And he did an amazing thing that I didn't know about for years, which was he went to Laddie and he said, if Larry goes over budget, and it was a very tiny budget, um, you can use my fee for the overages, which is an incredibly generous thing without ever telling me. And um, it's one of the great things that someone has done for me. I shouldn't have let you come. You're not so tough after all, are you? No, I'm weak. In the 70s was a time when acting in America was exploding. And there were some stars, but a generation was passing. And at the very moment that I was casting Body Heat, there was a whole generation of actors, Bill Hurt and uh, on and on, who were coming out of New York and doing great work. These were unknown people who were all getting an opportunity at that time. And I wanted the best people I could find. I wanted to find people that the American public did not know. I wanted them to enter this story as though it were a real story and um, discover these people for the first time and um, settled on Bill. You can stand there with me if you want, but you'll have to agree not to talk about the heat. I did all through states and did I witness. Uh, then came Body Heat and Body Heat. When I opened the script, I thought this is the flawless, flawless, flawless script. And so we met. I had heard Larry was a first-time director, which um, always makes you a little, a little nervous. And uh, we talked for six hours about this thing, about how, how great it was and, and how impossible it was going to be to live up to that. I'm a married woman. Meaning what? Meaning I'm not looking for company. And you should have said I'm a happily married woman. That's my business. Kathleen, she was exactly what I was looking for, some brand new face with some unusual physical qualities and the sound, perfect sound for film noir. I was doing theater. I'd just come back from Canada where I'd been doing The Seagull, and I got back to New York. And frankly, they wouldn't, they wouldn't see me for the part. They wouldn't let me in. Uh, they felt I had no film credit. About four months later, I think, I was out in Los Angeles uh, auditioning for a different film. And Wally Nacido was the casting director for Body Heat in L.A., and they had not cast the role. So she called me in, and I read for her. So then she set up a reading with, uh, with Larry and the producer, Fred Gallo. There were certain vocal similarities to Lauren Bacall, which didn't hurt. She had these incredible legs. There's a moment when she gets out of the car and stubs out her cigarette, you know, with her high heel. And 
She had the legs to pull it off. And I thought I did well with that, and then I got back to my hotel and there was a message, come back tomorrow. So I came back and read again the next day. And I, I wanted to show a complete contrast from the day before. The day before I'd been all dressed up with my highest heels and my tightest skirt and all that thing. So then second day I wore t-shirt and jeans, you know. And I kind of just stretched out on this couch and, and read the debt what he'd given me. And there was this quiet at the end and I, I looked up and, and Larry said, I never thought I'd hear that the way I hear it in my head. And I thought, well, that's, that's great, you know. He's coming up tomorrow. I can't stand the thought of him. He's small and mean and weak. So then they set up a screen test with Bill. We had tested lots of people, and they were good, and they were interesting, but there was nothing like when Bill and Kathleen tested together. I want to see the chimes. You want to see the chimes? I want to hear them. That's all. If I let you, then that's all. I'm not looking for trouble. And then we had to wait. I finally called up Larry. And uh, then they told me that, that they wanted Bill and me to do, to do the film. I think at that point, I had to go in and have a meeting with the executives at the studio. And I remember this room was white on white on white, a white sofa, white tables, white carpets, and a big ashtray in the middle filled with cigarette butts. And they, one of them said, you know, can you be funny or something? And I. I sort of said, oh, sure, and I threw my script on the table, which knocked the ashtray, flying ashes and butts all over this white carpet. And I, I was on my hands and knees trying to pick this, all this up, and, and they started laughing. And <laughs> they said, yes, you're funny. Thank you. This is Mr. Racine. I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. Ned. Edmund Walker, nice to meet you. I wanted everyone in the movie to have something worth doing. And so I tried to write the arsonist character as an interesting character. Anytime you try a decent crime, you got 50 ways you can fuck up. If you think it's 25 at end, then you're a genius. And you ain't no genius. You remember who told me that? The cop. Always starts hopping in weather like this. When it gets hot, people try to kill each other. The woman who runs the diner. I know some people who'll be dead if we don't get a break soon. The <laughs> DA. You know, that Edmund Walker was a bad guy. And the more I find out about him, the happier I am. He's dead. I think it's a positive thing for the world. I thought they were all good parts. And, I, and the, the man that the, is the victim. I wanted him to be an interesting character, not what we think he's going to be. Let everyone surprise us with their humanity. So I've tried to do that throughout. Uh, the next nine pictures I directed, too. I like to have them rich and full of believable people. I met lots of people for the Oscar and the Lowenstein part. And I just loved uh, J.A. Preston. I thought he had all that kind of moral authority that the character had to have. He is the one character in the movie who just has a code that he absolutely lives by. Ned, you've messed up before, and you'll mess up again. It's your nature. And Ted had done only Onion Field. It was the only thing I had seen him in. And I just thought he was terrific. I had a dream last night. so boring, it woke me up. I was afraid to go back to sleep. <laughs> I do remember that you could take the script that I auditioned with and go to the film right now, Body Heat, in a theater, and you could conduct it like a score. But truly, it was like I, somebody hired me, <laughs> you know, thank God. What are we making? What are we doing? How exciting. I don't think I understood uh, what I was getting involved in. I think I've underestimated you, Ned. I don't know why it took me so long. You started using your incompetence as a weapon. My defense was evolving. <laughs> you guys got scared. My, uh, my then wife and I invited Kathleen and, because they were all East Coast, and I lived in Los Angeles. Uh, Kathleen and Bill to our 
house on Hesby Street in North Hollywood, and there was a little backyard and a little pool. And my wife and, uh, and Kathleen were kind of sunbathing or something, and, and Bill and I were, I don't know, being athletic, doing something, swimming, doing, you know, whatever. And at one point he said, do you want to do the trust exercise? And I'm going, okay. <laughs> I'm probably in my, you know, speedo. And I went, yes, yes, I do. Because this is a very serious actor, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Juilliard trained, yes, yes, I'll do the trust exercise. And he reached down and grabbed my, my, uh, my balls and said, now you do the same to me. <laughs> it was like, uh, okay. I looked at him in the eye and said, you trust me? He goes, I don't know, should I? <laughs> The idea being, are you going to check your guns at the door, your ego, your competitive nature, and share something? Are you going to drop your defensiveness? Are you going to trust in some way? Nevertheless, it was quite, you know, it was quite strange uh, to do this. I guess the idea was to see who would go, you know, oh, no, no, I couldn't possibly do that, or... Uh, I, I don't know. I don't quite know. But I trust it. I trust a lot of therapy since then, and I'm basically okay now. I wish I knew what to tell you now, but I don't have any good ideas. I'll see you. Hey, lady, you want to fuck? I had been on a soap opera. And they looked for an actress who would be incredibly similar to me to, t to take over the role when I wanted to leave. You know, they asked me to come and look at these tapes of these five women, and I thought Kim Zimmer was the closest to me. So when, when Larry said, well, now we have to find a, a woman, you know, an actress who could be mistaken for you, I said, well, I have, I know one. You know, <laughs> she took over my old role on the, on the soap opera. And so we called her up and, uh, so that's actually how, how we found Kim. You two have fun now. Fortunately, Larry Kasdan does believe in, in rehearsal, in really a good four weeks of rehearsing. And there was never any sense of going for a particular result in a scene. I think he was so confident in the material that we would just rehearse and play and rehearse and play so that you become so familiar with the material in a, an organic way, and you're not trying to shoot for results. That's a wonderful thing for an actor. My background being all theater, I, I really didn't know any other way uh, to work. So it was exciting to be doing film, but having the full underpinning, the, um, the structure of rehearsing it like a play so that we knew just where we were, no matter what conjunction the scenes were in, no matter out of context or before or after, we knew where they fit into our performances. Larry always rehearsed. I mean, we were allowed to rehearse, and um, we rehearsed all our films. Tourist and Chill and I Love You to Death, we rehearsed all those films. And that's where you can bring consideration, you know, to the work. Oh, you can't buy me. I don't come cheap. People ask me, you know, what a great idea. Was that your idea to dance? Why does he do that? That's pretty good. That's the weird part. You can pick up the script and, you know, it says, does Fred Astaire dance? Da -da -da -da. And everything was choreographed beforehand. Well, Larry hired a choreographer and we, we uh, rehearsed this dance scene on the dock for about two weeks. And I had worked on it in a studio you know, hardwood floor, mirrors, and a dance bar. So I had really gotten it down. And I went out there, and all of a sudden, this hardwood floor, mirrors, dance bar studio was not there, and it was this fishing dock that was covered in fish grease and heads and oil. So the thing was completely slick and very rough and rugged. And, you know, my little perfect dance went flying out the window, and, uh, I was struggling not to just, you know, do the splits and slip. I was very excited by the possibility of dealing with the actors. That I had wanted to be an actor, I had done some acting, and I wasn't very good at it, and so I gave it up and concentrated on writing and directing.
but I loved actors. I still do. I'm amazed by what they can do. They, to me, they're like at great athletes, which is they look like a normal person sort of when you're in the room with them, but when they start doing the thing that they do well, it's magical. Yeah, I figured that uh, honest lawyers didn't make very much, and the other kind were too slimy for me. Now, I'd rather be up front about shafting somebody. I mean, really, it's Mr. Racine's profession. No, that's all right. I don't like it much. Alan Ladd Jr., who was so supportive of this movie, and um, we had one moment of disagreement in the whole movie, which is that when we were in rehearsal, I got a message that Laddie wanted Bill Hurt to shave his mustache. He hated the mustache, and I was dumbfounded. It had never occurred to me that he would have an opinion about that. Laddie said to me, um, it makes him look sleazy, which it does. We'll see those reckless bastards dry. Oh, excuse my language. Conversation ended, and I started getting calls from Paula Weinstein, who was the executive, assigned to me. At that time, she said, you know, Larry, Laddie has been so supportive of you, and he's given you everything you want, you know, in this small movie, but, and he's asking you to shave that mustache, and you better do it. And I said, you know, Paula, I agree with you. He's been wonderful, but I really believe this is right. And so she said, well, when we see those first dailies, the mustache better be gone. They were in Los Angeles. I was in Florida. And we hung up, and I didn't do it. And we sent in our first dailies, and he had the mustache, which I thought was exactly right. And we never heard another word. It taught me a very important lesson about just going ahead with the thing you really believe in. and. Um, not being afraid. I had written Body Heat to be made in specific locations on the Jersey Shore, the New Jersey Shore. And we were all prepared to start shooting the movie there when the Screen Actors Guild went on strike. And we had to postpone, and the locations that I wanted to use now suddenly became snow-covered. It was going to be winter in New Jersey. So we rescouted Charlie Oaken, who was working for, with me at that time, went down to Florida and brought me when he found equivalents for everything we had found in New Jersey, and we decided to shoot the movie around Lake Worth, Florida. But it happened to be the coldest winter ever in Florida at that time. That made it quite difficult to film, and it was very uncomfortable for the actors also that had to go around in skinny clothing, or no clothing, and uh, be sprayed with uh, sweat on their clothing and whatnot while we were in huge, heavy jackets. And everything that creates the heat was done either in the acting, in the sound, in, in the wind, uh, all of the uh, effects that we used to create the feeling of heat for body heat. It was, it's all an illusion. My God, it's hot. Stepped out of the shower and started sweating again. It's still burning? When they're complaining about the heat, we had to hide their breath, which was showing. And when Ned and Maddie meet on the boardwalk, the wind was blowing so cold and heavily that we had to park the trucks just off camera to block the ocean. It wasn't a breeze. The winds that were blowing in and freezing, uh, Bill and Kathleen, as they had this sultry introduction along the hot boardwalk. Those days were very, very cold. And for me, the terror and horror of body heat was the spritz bottle. Oh, God. They're walking up behind you, you know, because the shirts had to be wet, and the thing had to be wet, and the face had to be wet, and then you had to act hot. You'd hold ice in your mouth until the camera rolled, and then spit it out so that you wouldn't have the steam coming out because the air was so cold. You're not too smart, are you? <laughs> I like that in a man. But I wanted the tone of their first conversation to Establish a certain kind of stylized language. What else do you like? Lazy, ugly, horny? I got them all. You don't look lazy. 
a certain kind of humor, which I felt was absolutely vital to the whole project. I need someone to take care of me, someone to rub my tired muscles, smooth out my sheets. Get married. I just need it for tonight. Mm. <laughs> I wanted them to be funny with each other. Oh, nice move, Maddie. Maddie, I like it. It's right over your heart. At least it's cool. I was burning up. I asked you not to talk about the heat. I wanted them to be excited by each other, and turned on. And I wanted to give a nod to the kind of language that had been in the noir of the 50s. And that language was very satisfying, very beautifully constructed. Well, I'll even wipe it off for you. You don't want to lick it? It was, it was great, it was great. I mean, I loved that dress. It was a very, very heavy, like a triple silk, you know, really heavy, so it just clung to the body and moved like another layer of skin almost, you know, which felt gorgeous. And uh, it was sweet, funny, the, the flirtation, the, you know, don't you want to lick it off? It's, it's always very enjoyable. Well, I think Larry relied on my instincts very much. I certainly didn't think of myself as any kind of femme fatale. In fact, my recurrent nightmare at the time was that I would cast a smoldering glance over toward Bill and the audience would start to giggle. I, I think my lack of awareness was very helpful to the character to make her seem, you know, less manipulative and more, uh, more natural. There are some men, once they get a whiff of it, they trail you like a hound. I'm not that eager. We learned very, very little about her. So a lot of it really was just my own story making. I've missed you so badly. I need you. How she moves, all of that is just, is calculated. That shot when she opens the car door and puts out, you know, rubs out her cigarette with her toe. You know, that was just obvious to me. <laughs> That's how you do it. So I don't know, a lot of it's very instinctive to me. Now leave me alone. The one concern I had probably was about how we would handle the sex scenes because um, it's a very uncomfortable situation generally, you know, to have actors doing that. There's nothing less sexy really than a, a film set. And yet within the frame, you're trying to create as sexy a thing as you can possibly can. And then the actors have to trust each other enormously. It's so intimate. And then an odd thing happened, which was I was dreading this scene in the boathouse, which was going to come up first of the scenes and was the most explicit. And we had a problem with the schedule. We had to change something. And we wound up doing that scene on the first day in the afternoon. And so all my strategies for doing it had to be put into place instantly. Well, that came as a bit of a shock to me. And so there Bill and I are, you know, down on set in the boathouse in our robes, saying, hello, I'm Kathleen. Oh, and you're Jack, and you're, oh, you're Ed. Nice to meet you, Ed. <sighs> I took the crew down to absolute minimum, the operator, the cinematographer, and me, and I tried to create a space where they felt safe. I invited each member of the shooting crew into the room one by one. And I said to each one, and I held his hand, looked in his eye, and I said, you're entering my home. You know, you're not a voyeur here. Looking back, I think we were incredibly brave, and I think it really was breakthrough, groundbreaking work. Whatever nervousness they had about it was not apparent. And they, and they had been rehearsing, you know, we had rehearsed and we had talked a lot about it. And um, so by getting that most raw scene out of the way on the first day, all the anxiety about that really went away. Everything seemed easy after that. No voyeurism here, no prurience here, no smarmy sex thing here, because that just disgusts and demeans. So, because there was something to save in the structure and the morality tale. So we approached it in a very, very considered way, a very, very conscious way. Usually, after we'd done a, a, you know, a long scene with, with nudity, I, I'd have to go to my room and just sort of shake and sob for a while because 
really, you do have to steal. I mean, the set's closed, but you still have some 20 people or something, you know, running the camera and the sound and the lights and everything who are standing there watching you. And, and it's such private stuff that I would feel very shaken up by when I hear cut, you know. I got, all right, all right, I gotta go, you know, I gotta go away for a minute, guys, you know. It was tough. Every day, there would be a surprise for me when I would go to see dailies. It, it was as though I, I would absolutely be excited when I would see a shot that was a typical archetypal noir shot. One of the visual motifs in the movie was how, do, how are they melded? And there are several moments in the movie when their images are melded. And one is when she gives him a hat, but it's not just a regular hat, it's a 1940s fedora, you know, a real film noir hat. And then he says, I want to see, and she rolls up the window, and her image disappears, and his appears in the reflection on the window, wearing this 40s hat. And they really have melded at that point. What's happened? Because we're gonna kill him. In the office, when they actually come out with it and decide. That was a big moment for me in the movie, and this is the place where we would stay a long time on their embrace. And the camera booms up, 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 above where we know that ceiling is. And that's the point at which Dick Klein said to me, you know, whose point of view is this? And I said, it's God's point of view. It really was cinematic, pulling back, which we do often in a film. And uh, not that it was motivated, but it turned out to be correct, really correct. And uh, it was Larry's initial idea. I didn't quite know what he wanted, but I think he, he devised that extremely well. That man is going to die for no reason, but we want him dead. It is the moment at which they make the fatal decision and, you know, they, they're choosing between heaven and hell at that moment. What's wrong? I think someone's downstairs. He has a gun! Where? In the 70s, um, we began to see violence depicted the same way we saw sex explicitly depicted. I didn't want it to be like that. It was much more like a Hitchcock film where they're fighting for the gun. And so to me, that in all movies, it's better that way. I'm not that interested to see see the explicit thing. And um, you think it's a movie about them killing her husband, but then at this point, it becomes a movie about her betrayal and her having manipulated him. He's really caught in the trap. They meet at a higher class law firm in West Palm Beach, and we go in with him. And in fact, the room is revealed entirely from his point of view. Mrs. Walker, I am very sorry about your husband. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. And what's happening is that we are discovering with Ned things that we don't know. Who are the players here? And now things are getting worse. I want you more right now than I ever have. I know how you must feel, but please come tonight. He has no choice, really, but he's constantly being drawn to her and put away. Drawn to her, and when at the critical moment, she actually disappears. When it's good for her to disappear, and he's left holding the bag. And she literally disappears into the blackness at the very moment when he's sure, finally certain that he knows what she's about and that she's been out to kill him and that he's been totally betrayed. I was, uh, of course, very aware of, the, of the, the tradition of film noir. We were very aware of this world and, and wanted to tighten the tension more and more and more until we get at the archetypal. Uh, shot. The only thing you see is this woman in her white dress. Larry and I were looking at her that night when she walks in in that white dress, and we were watching her take because we, you know, she just has to turn her back. And and since the light was blinding from behind the camera, when she turned for the look, she couldn't actually see anything but the silhouette of the actor off camera. So she looked and she walked away. And as she's walking away, I just whispered to uh, to Larry, "She's incredible." No. 
The shot where we discover Ned in jail, which is along the cells from above, was strictly a case of there was an old jail in Long Beach that was actually set up that way where the it didn't go up to the ceiling. The bars went up and they turned and you could see through the ceiling. And when I saw that location, I said, oh, this is fantastic. We're going to discover him from above. She's alive. When Ned is in jail and has plenty of time to finally think about what has happened to him. We found a body in the boathouse. What if that was somebody else's body in the boathouse? What if it was already there when I got there, dead and waiting for me? Maybe her friend, Marianne. Because she's been so far ahead of him at each step. But he gets an idea of what might have happened. And then he gets the confirmation in the high school yearbook. And um, he is confirmed. He's all alone. He's stuck in jail for life. But he is right. He's finally caught up to her. She's alive. She ends up on the beach, missing him. She's got what she wanted, except that she didn't think she was actually going to fall for the guy. I think she probably uh, ended up extremely unhappy and lonely and, do you know, I, she would never trust love again. I mean, having completely betrayed love herself, she would never accept it from anyone else. So I think she's quite condemned, actually. We um, went to Catalina. Uh, Catalina is a kind of an ordinary island. It, uh, it didn't appeal to me at all. And I took Larry off to the side and I said, Larry, we got a magnificent film here. You can't shoot it here. I said, I think I know just the place. And it happened to be a place where I've surfed a lot of times on Maui. And um, I said, I'll bring in a research picture for you. And I did. I brought in a still picture. And they liked it. And that's where we went. What? It is hot. There was coverage on the guy, but we didn't use it in the film because it was really about her isolation. She has been isolated by her acts. And though she may not pay for them, She's paying for him in the worst possible way is that she's, it's now she has unrequited love for this man that she actually fell in love with. It's, it's tragic. I have always felt, and the last shot is most indicative of it, that she has unexpectedly developed feelings for him. And Kathleen is very good there. She does not look like the champion. She looks much more split and torn about what's going on. And I think that's exactly right, that she has this ambivalence. And that's classic noir. No matter what you think, I do love you. I felt really good about the material we had. I was looking forward to going into the editing room and seeing how much of it was going to stand the test of the editing and how much would not. When I was looking for an editor, I, I was absolutely set on getting a woman because I wanted this very sexual movie to not just be some male fantasy. I wanted a woman's voice in there at, at, at the moment when we were making all the judgments about the sexual aspects of the movie. And I luckily met Carol Littleton, who then wound up cutting most of my movies, and I've known now for 25 years. My temperature runs a couple of degrees high, around 100. I don't mind. It's the engine or something. Maybe you need a tune-up. I told Larry that what I loved above everything else was the fact that it had an extraordinary sense of humor. And he said, oh, really? Did I say the wrong thing? <laughs> he said, you're the only person that I've talked to who understood that there was a sense of humor. I like this place. It's got a nice feel. You were on top. So I could use a better mattress. See to it, will you? Yes, sir. Clearly in the footage, many times there were more explicit things happening. But both of us felt that it's, one's imagination is far more powerful than actually showing explicit sexual material. So that was one of the reasons why Larry, I think, felt
felt he needed to have a woman editor. Be careful. I'm just going for a ride. I wish it was all this dangerous. When we looked at the film, it seemed to, at least for audiences, it seemed to have a, a, a moment where it started and held tremendous tension and, and the film started to soar. There was a first attempt to kill. It was just unnecessary, where it was a delay of the plot. And I, it was clear when we put the movie together that me and everybody watching it was getting ahead of the movie. It just seemed to work better when we cut it out. And in cutting out the, the attempted murder, we actually used parts of the attempted murder night and then the murder night. And if you look very closely, it's very difficult to say. Thank goodness she wore pretty much the same nightgown. And of course, Edmund, you know, just wore his shorts or whatever. Uh, and the only difference are the sheets. The sheets for the attempted murder were a very light gray stripe. And they were a solid sheet, colored sheet, on the night of. And we just used a sleight of hand, used the tightest shots possible, and put the two nights together. When I think about it, I wish he'd die. That's really what I want. It's horrible and it's ugly. And it's what I most want. The music is a character in the film. It defines a space and it defines a, a, an emotional place for the film. John Barry is extraordinary. I remember specifically when he was talking about how he wanted to fashion the theme, and he thought body heat had a certain rhythm to it. And if you say it in English, body heat, da 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 it has the rhythm of the words. John Barry's score is very much the kind of thing I wanted, but he did it much better than I had hoped. I mean, it's, I think it's one of the great scores for this kind of movie. They sent a screenplay to me, which I read, which I liked very much. And I said, yes, I'd like to, uh, at this point, I'd like to meet with the director. It didn't seem like it was his first movie. He was very in charge of everything, knew exactly what he wanted, totally clear, and uh, amazingly clear about the music and what he wanted and what he wanted it to do in these, in, in these specific places. So uh, he'd obviously thought the musical pattern through very clearly. He understood immediately about the sensuality, about the heat, about the kind of uh, laziness that that heat brings on in the people, and then the sudden eruption of passion, you know, that, that, that breaks it up. And it's all there in the score. I think the theme came very quickly. Um, I just thought back to all those uh, Humphrey Bogart movies and all those, those wonderful movies that were made in the, in, in the 30s and early 40s. I mean, the main theme is, is, is a jazz ballad. And I, I thought it was appropriate. I, I thought it, it was very simple. It was a jazz ballad, uh, plus the figure from the piano, the strident figure of the chords, and then the low end was just the low strings. So it had a fullness. It had. It was very simple, but very. It had great clarity to it, which is the way I love to work. And I think you have to get that main theme that is like a hook, like, like the fish. That unity is, to me, the most important thing because that's the, the whole score, it's the whole entity. And um, I was very fortunate to be surrounded by um, musicians who understood that language and didn't say, what do you mean, or whatever. They were very, very involved in the whole piece, which made life very easy for me. Uh, there was a wonderful alto sax player called uh, Ronnie Lang. And I said, I went over this with I said, you know, he's, he's like a, a central voice, but he was able to, um, to do that very well. It gave it all that color. And then when you come to the closing titles and that last scene, you've got to come up with, with the king piece that really comes through on that in, in a major level and hits the audience. So they go, oh my God. And, it's, it's extremely satisfying when that works. And you can feel it in the audience. You just, when you listen to that closing music, you just say, we nailed the bastards, you know. So when I went to see it the first time, first of all, I was just, I was just blown, blown away by the, the, the music, the editing. Larry wants everyone to do their best, and he, he has that eye for the undercurrents of their, of their abilities. 
and helps to release our, our guardedness. These things are precious, because Larry is, as far as, as I'm concerned, the best, the best experience as a director I've ever had in film, and we had a, we've had a great relationship. It was the three of us against the whole Hollywood system. You know, we were gonna make a film the way and the quality that we, we saw uh, in our hearts, our minds, you know. So in that sense, it felt very safe, because we were like this club, you know, that we protected each other's backs, and I knew I could depend on both of them, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me down, and I was not going to let them down. So it felt, it felt very safe in many ways, which is surprising given that the material was so unsafe. You ready to hear something really wild? Oh, no, I may have had my share today. No, no, this is right up your alley. Oh, I have a little story. My mother, who's no longer with us, <laughs> and was, you know, didn't have a television and uh, didn't go to movies or anything like that. She went to see Body Heat and walked out. She was so disturbed by the sexual content that she lied to me over the years. That, you know, I found this out maybe four or five years ago that she actually never saw Body Heat because she was up and out. Uh, it was a powerfully sexual, passionate, dark, noir dark movie. I mean, it, he really pulled that off. A lot, I mean, I think it was as good, if not better, than the original film noirs. It wasn't like a, a rip-off. It was film noir. I've told Larry several times that in his past life, he must have been a director, even though this was his, his first assignment, but he certainly was very qualified, he had good command, very good ideas, he knew how to select right from wrong and that type of thing. I think it's the perfect film when it comes to all the crafts. I, I just feel that I understood, first of all, the humanity that's deep inside Larry's bones, who he really is. And I also feel I understood his quirky sense of humor. And I just instantly knew what he liked and disliked. It was a shorthand that we could uh, work and concentrate on the movie and I, I, I had a very, very strong sense of, of direction even without his having to direct me. When your first movie comes out, you don't know what to expect. And back then, there was not all this coverage of movies ahead of time, you know, and a movie was more of a surprise to people when it came out and then it had a chance to live and grow in the theaters and last a long time. And I remember that Time magazine came out and it was two pages about the movie and a rave review and basically it went on like that it was it, my concern was would I get to make a second picture but from that day forward when that time magazine landed on my porch in Spring Lake I stopped worrying about that Thank you.